answers. Um, but actually, the Q and A is really the is is the point where we'd like to get some questions and answers going. This is not a long session that we're talking about. We're going to give this sort of half an hour presentation, try and take you through, and then uh, open it up to the floor. As there's a lot of questions, we've had a we've had excellent feedback through the week, so um, I expect this to be a quite a big Q and A session. Barry, do you want to add to that? Any anything before we kick off? No, good to be back. Um, I'm feeling quite in fit. Um, looking forward to the session, Mark. Right. Okay. Well, let's. You've got your screen up there. Um, yeah. Part two from 3D printing continued. So if everything works here with the, come on. There we go. So, we are we are on the uh, live on YouTube now. I've managed to get that sorted. Oh, even better. Um, yeah, I think I think Trevor Waters there might have missed the. Uh, the apology about uh, the session. Uh, I think he's had a question that looks very much like it's a laser cutting question. Um, we may. I'll, we, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. We will. We will answer that one later, and we'll. We'll also. Um, we will be bringing a, a laser session shortly, another week, probably next week. I think, next Barry, week. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, just wanted to really sort of. We had a lot of feedback from from last week, and I've pulled up a couple of the um, most poignant parts of that feedback. One of them was um, Peter Becker, who's probably in the room, or hopefully he's in the room, but he wrote us a, a very nice email um, supplying a wealth of info and a link to Paul and Ralph Bradley's model aeroplane hangout. Now there is a link here and I will get we'll get Andy to put that on the on the chat so you can all go and have a look at it. We commented last week about propellers. Well this looks like one of the old sort of sleek streak, very simple propellers. And we've got some spinners here. Um, these are freely available for 3D printing on this website. So you can go there. They're all different diameters and pitches of propellers, different spinner sizes. Um, and it's really what it's all about for me. This is what I love about error modeling. Um, the fact that somebody has taken the time to make these and then just make them make them freely available for everybody. So look, a big shout out to, to, to this Paul and Ralph Bradley here. It's also a very interesting site. I, I spent a good hour reading through it. So um, yeah, fill your boots, everybody, with it. Um, Peter also pointed out um, a detailed article in the American NFS Symposium in from 2019 by Paul Bradley. Um, I have actually seen this, and I'd forgotten all about this, but it is a, it is a, a super article. Now, obviously, we can't reproduce the NFS symposium for you or, or reproduce this but actually i'd sort of commend it and if anybody is interested i we can have a word with uh, the president there and, and maybe we can get some extracts of that or or certainly if there's any more in print um, we can put you in touch with the symposium books but it is a very very good article um it is 2019 so it's still pretty relevant um and uh, i know technology moves on quickly but um most mo most of it is absolutely relevant and poignant today. Um, Mike Francis, um, we've worked, I've worked with Mike uh, most commonly from his rocketry days. Uh, he did a lot of rocketry development work with carbon fiber composites. Um, and, you know, he, he was right at the top of his game. I, I may, may be getting it wrong here, but I believe he actually did win the world championships on one of the rocketry classes. Um, very, very skilled um, 3D machinist, um, works with CNC laser. And, um, and also he sent, kindly sent me some 3D print examples here, which are rather wonderful car bodies for some tether cars that he's been, uh, he's been geared up. I believe these and Andy that probably have been whizzing around at Buckminster. Uh, certainly, some have yes, yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike certainly been to Buckminster. He's certainly taken part. I've seen seen him in the videos. Um, so we've got a Mike is extremely, um, you know, like I say, experienced in this, and he's he's had these are I think these are resin these are resin uh, resin prints, and he's also he's also looked at other types of printing as well. So a wealth of knowledge there. And what we'll do is we'll have a chat with him. In some at some stage, and um, see if we can pick his brains on a little bit more of the real technical stuff at, in due course. But I thought you'd like to see these, um, and then 
again just zooming in on some of these you know these are these are wonderfully sculpted parts and another person who's making fuel tanks barry so yes. yeah. you know again i think this is this is just this is aero modeling at its best really this is producing these tanks so i think again we'll have some conversations there with with mike um and see what he can what he can throw up throw up or throw out even i mean we don't want him to throw up we'd rather not do that um so just following up from from all of the, you in the room who were here last week um i posed a question to you all is there anything you would like us to 3d model and print for you for our next session now that happened pretty quickly we got a lot of people throwing in ideas um, we had a very quick consultation midweek and we actually picked one of the components, which is a holder for a Spectrum RX. Now, all, all, of, all of you in the all of you with radio control know about these these yeah, uh, it's, uh, the sat it's the satellite RX. Satellite the, RX. Yeah, yeah, it's the auxiliary RX. Okay. So Barry posed this to me as well and said, well, look, let's make a let's make a holder for it. Um, we st I started off at this point and I'm going to just sort of try and take you through the process for anybody who's who's never actually looked at considered how to make a holder or make anything for any other component. So we've put it in very, very simple, simple form here. So the sketch idea. What should it look like? Well, I said to Barry, I'm not a radio flyer. So this is this was relatively new to me. And forgive me, I'm, you know, Barry will correct me all the way through. Barry put together a thumbnail sketch here, suggesting some spring clips to latch the satellite to, to cut out at the right places. Um, and so we've got the bones of a of what this, this component is going to look like. Now, for anybody who's 3D modeling or 2D modeling, this is fine but it is a concept, it has no dimensions to it. So the very next stage that we have to do, we have to consider and get a detailed drawing or measure this component, get accurate dimensions and produce a relatively accurate or ideally a very, very accurate two dimensional drawing of all the different facets. This is just an extract of, the, of what we put together. Now, the importance of this is that we want to be pretty close with the initial print. Ideally, we'd like to be spot on. But we, as I mentioned last week, sometimes tolerances with the printing, you know, there, there are differences. So we, we might have to go through prototyping. But it, essentially, the whole idea here, we get an accurate drawing. You can sit down with the 3D package. You refer to this. I normally print them out and have it on a piece of paper with all the dimensions. I actually don't have two screens open for this. Um, some people work off a drawing. I'm quite happy to work off a, a you know a detailed paper drawing rather than it being on the screen. Once I once I've got these dimensions, you look to put to get put the 3D model together using a, a piece of software. In this case, I use um, Fusion 360, um, which is a or it it's a it's it's an Autodesk product. It's free for students, I believe, or non-commercial use. So it's readily available and it's relatively intuitive. You know, it's not something you're going to, you're not going to make this first time round, probably in an evening. This might take you a couple of evenings, but but one would hope within, you know, a couple of evenings, you've got a pretty, pretty good model put together. Um, the tools that are available within the software package are very, very intuitive. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of online um, tutorials and YouTube, especially, and they're, they're they're fantastic. You know, the majority are really really good. So this was the this is the the 3D model. This this took me. I think the first I spent a couple of hours playing with it the first time round. Sent it across to Barry, and Barry kindly pointed out that I'd got the uh, the RX upside down, mounted upside down in it, so everything was back to front. Um, so I. I, I rejigged it and um you know in total you're talking about probably three hours work for me to do this um 
and I hadn't I had to refresh myself on the software package as well. So I hadn't used this for quite some time. I've been using a slightly more outdated package. So in terms of, I'm going to show some software in a moment, but in terms of the production process here, once you've actually, I'm going to get, see if I could go back here. Once we have this product drawn up, this model drawn up within the 3D package, we need to put it into our 3D slicer. We need to export it. And one of the standard and very simple mechanisms of exporting is it in a file format called an STL file. And what, what that does, that sends a very, very simple file. It's a very small file, tight, often very, very tiny. You know, they're not even megabytes large. You know, <laughs> they are very, very small. And then we can put it into our 3D slicer. So I'm going to try and flick screens here, if this allows me to do this. Let me try and get this in now. I'm going to go into, I'm going to start off with the most simple. This is your, this is what Dremel supply. So you can see it's a, a Digilab 3D slicer here, but this is actually for, this is the Cura piece of software. This is fairly common, I think, Barry, isn't it? It's a- Yeah, I think it's, I think it's the most common. Yeah, it's, it's and, just- And all, all Dremel do is they just brand, they just brand it up. Yeah. yeah. So let me, what we're going to do, we're just going to zoom out a little bit and, and hopefully everybody can see this. I don't, I know you can't see my mouse. I don't think you can see my mouse, can you? No. No. Well, no. Yeah, you can just see the arrow. Oh, you can see the mouse. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, look, there's, there's the, the model there. I'm going, to, I'm going to import another one. So I'm going to bring another one in and just show people how, if we can do this. Right, we've got a, another tray there. So I've imported that in. And then you've got some very, very simple tools. This is where, where this software wins. Very, very simple. So ro rotate things. And we've now got two in there. Then you can move them about with very, very simple pieces of software. So that's your, you can put a number of these on, on, the, on the bed. What you, you do have to be careful and you have to consider how you're going to print them. If you're printing multiples, do they clash with each other? Do you print them one at a time or do you pick, print them all together? If you're printing them all together, it will print by lines. So it will work from the point of view of point zero all the way up to the top and it will go all the way across the, the plate. Now, I, in my experience, they don't print as well doing that. It is far better to print one at a time. And... The software package here on the right hand side, we, we choose our materials and there's a series of materials and you can choose the different types of quality and standards here. And there's a standard. This is these are recommended. I've put the recommended settings on to show you here. So you've got PLAR is the material PLA. Well, I've got it set at high quality. We can set it at medium quality. And you can probably read that and you've got different different qualities, 0.2 of a millimetre, high qualities, 0.1, high speed, 0.34, and ultra qualities, 0.05. So that's the, that's the tolerance, that's the detail level. Then you've got an infill. So your, your broad finishes, you, you have an infill and you've got different, different densities of infill. Um, I've never tried 0%. I don't know whether you've ever tried 0%, Barry. Is that just a shell? Yeah, I haven't tried that. 5% is the lowest I've tried. Yeah. yeah. 20% is quite normal and you can go up and you can actually graduate it as well. Other, other little things that you look at here that are quite important, generate support on something that's a flat model that sits on a bed and a heated bed, generating support is just not important. You know, this thing will stick like the proverbial to the sheet of glass. Build plate adhesion, again, that's a, that's a sorry, generate, build plate adhesion is, I'm going to take this in reverse. Let me rewind. Build plate adhesion is to do with how it sticks to the to the bo bottom of this plate. You can actually create brims and you can create all different ways of actually holding this model firmly on the plate. The support is for supporting things that are overhanging in this instance. So anything overhang. So in our case, we have some little clips here that are sitting in free air. So what will happen is that the software will generate a very small support that will support that one component there and a singular one there. 
there's no other support required for this. It's all, it's a very, very simple model. Without going into to detail, there are lots of other complexities. These are all your, your various def defaults here, printing temperatures, um, and lots and lots of other things that you can play around with. And I would always st suggest start from the recommended, print it, have a look at it and go, right, what do I need to do? And then start to break, break it down and look at that. One of the things I was gonna show on this though, which I think we touched upon, if I can find it. So special modes, the print sequence, if you print one at a time, you can see now it's put a fence on there. So if we take this model, what we need to do is, is make sure that those fences ideally are out of the way. And that means that the print head can quite happily hammer around on this, finish that one and move on to the next one. There are times when you cannot move them around and you there's only one way of printing. And that's normally to do with the height of the of the model. So that is one type of 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 3d now last week we talked about one of barry's preferred software which is at the top here is simplify 3d so it's the same model you can see there's the same model it's a little clearer here um barry i'm not i don't use this a lot is there anything you want to point out on this um i wouldn't mind if you could just go prepare to print mark bottom left Ah, you haven't selected. I haven't said anything. No, okay. Uh, no, it's. I just slightly preferred um, Simplify 3D. They're, they're fairly fairly similar. Um, I don't think it handles the model quite as well when you're uh, flipping the model around as Cura. But no, it, it, they they both do the same thing. I think a very important thing to say at this point in time. There's no fixed way to do all of this. There's lots of different 3D software, uh, CAD software out there. There's a number of different slices and not as many slices as there is CAD software, that's for sure. And the same with the equipment. Um, it just happens that Mark and I both have the Dremel, yes. the Dremel printers. Um, I think if you were to go and um, buy a printer, most people would say, peruser printers uh seem to be favorite um and then there's the enders and those kind of things i personally like the enclosed printers um keeps workshop dust off of the um off of the mechanism and also it keeps a kind of a a more stable temperature in there you don't you don't get the vagaries of or if you open the window or anything like that so yeah and it's the same with the filaments as well there's so many different filaments. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But no, no one way is the right way to do it. Is basically what I'm saying. There's lots of lots of ways to get to the end game. Yeah. While we're on this, is there any Q and A's reference where we've been at the moment? Just before we, there is a little bit, and one of them was quite relevant. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a couple there. Um, Ron Gray asked, what filament for printing tanks and what supports? So if we were to think of a conventional uh, bottle type uh, clunk tank, that's what I uh, made quite successfully now. Um, but you, you, you know that the kind of the shape of it at the, at the front of the tank, you think, well, you've got to have some support there. Um, so I actually, you don't really want to have su support for these pillars that enable you to kind of print over uh, overhangs, but you don't really want supports inside a tank. Um, how are you going to get them out unless the tank's in two pieces? So you, what you have to do is be a bit crafty about how you shape the, the front of the tank so that the, uh, and this is the same for anything. If you if you don't want to have the support, let's say it's an enclosed thing and you don't want to have the support, you've got to be a little bit crafty in the design to enable you uh, to print print without support. Ron also asked what material. Um, my fuel tanks, I've done them with two different materials and both have been okay. Um, PLA seems to be, pretty resistant to nitromethane fuel. I'm not saying you can 
leave the fuel in there for long periods of time or anything like that but certainly through the course of a day um and if you drain the tank down at the end of the day which is what you should do anyway um we have tanks now that are 18 months in in use um with 10 percent fuel and no no problem i also did make some tanks with a a flexible material tpu um uh nin, ninja ninja tech i think it was called um but the, it wasn't really needed so we, we've just printed solid tanks mm-hmm. adrian asked what is in the fill so you can print a part um with completely solid like an injection molding and the bit later mark and i'll show you some parts and they, they're they 100 percent they're like a, they're like an injection molding last week there was the wing tips shown on uh, one on some of our pylon races well the density of the plastic would be way too much to um print that wing tip at 100 that'd be like a solid plastic wing tip it'd be very heavy not nice also wasteful because it really is not doing anything. So infill is a, a, a way of getting mm. typically hex, hexagon type honeycomb structure in inside something so that you don't have to print it solid. So what does that mean? It means it prints quicker, it uses less material um, and, and it's lighter. So in the case of the wing tips, they were only 5% infill. Um, then there was another thing from I've Ron. One, let me pick up the one from Trevor Waters. I think I'm, I'm what, yeah. he's, what he's suggesting here, which is relevant to the infill, really. That he's talking, I think he's talking about the edge of the material. Now, no, Tre- Trevor, Trevor's question was when uh, he his was a laser cutting question. Ah, it was. I was thought, yeah, yeah, about, yeah. we'll answer that one later. Then that's an easy, yeah, question, yeah, um, yeah. Ro- Ron, Ron asked, us, "Do we pressure test the tanks?" Yes. Yeah, I always pressure test a tank, whether it's a commercial clunk tank or a, a tin tank that's been made, or now 3D printed. So yeah, always I always pressure test them, and they pressure test great. Having said that, Ron, the wall thickness is quite quite thick. To get a homogeneous shell, I'm printing at one one and three quarter millimeters wall thickness. Um, Pat said, um, okay, we'll, we'll come back to Pat's uh, question later. Yeah, I think we should push on, Mark. No, absolutely. I was just going to show everybody what happens with the slicing. Um, I've just set my printing over the network. It's uh, it, this, this model of uh, Dremel that I have has a nice little small camera in it. Um, it doesn't always show up when you come to print for some reason, probably because I'm sharing it at the moment. But it has a nice little camera that you can actually watch the printing or you can actually just set up a, a small camera to watch. Um, don't sit and watch it. It'll get rather bored after a few hours. It's uh, it's it's not the best thing. Um, we talked about the software for um, creating the. Creating the model itself. Um, again, this this is Illustrator Pro. This is sorry, this is inventor pro which is very very similar to 360 which is similar to the fusion 360 um and it's it's quite a complex piece of kit this but there, it does it does produce things very easy so for instance if you wanted to put a hole in something um i don't know if it's going to show me all of this so i put it on the right screen it gives you the options of having countersunk holes uh counter bore holes spot faces you can even put threads on so because it's an engineering package it allows you to do an awful lot more in the 3d modeling whereas some of the more basic packages you just create a hole but when we create a two millimeter hole for what for here and i would i would just create a hole and put a very small chamfer on it and chamfer is a very standard operation for 3d modeling um again uh, this is a session that we could we could spend a week on um learning how to use the 3d software but i think all i would say is to everybody i just encourage everybody to try and get hold of a piece of software create a 3d a, a create a 2d sketch of what you want to achieve and then draw it 
seek to draw it, follow the YouTube, you'll be amazed how quickly you can produce something. You know, there are lots of shortcuts, there are lots of different ways of producing something, but essentially you can produce elements like this very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also a lot to share. There is an awful lot out there. On, I think GrabCAD CAD is one of the sites. Um, there is an awful lot of error modeling 3D hit on there, servo holders, um, servo horns and things like that. All I would say is if you're using anything structural, such as a servo horn, test it first. Don't just put it on your model and assume it works because somebody's made it. Let's, you know, get them printed. Um, Barry, do you want to mention anything about servo horns? Because obviously you made a few or some linkages. Yeah, so, yeah we, we've made um, aileron uh, torque rod horns, so a sort of strip aileron linkage. Um, at, at, you know, the inboard end, you, you have to have some way to connect up the push rod to it. You can just bend, out, bend it over and put a piece of brass tube over it and solder it and cross drill it. Um, we were looking for something a little bit more elegant um, and uh, printed some pretty successful um, aileron uh, torque rod horns. Um, yeah, like you said, Mark, I, I, I never do something like that without sort of testing it on the bench. It's only empirically tested. Um, yeah. But uh, they, we, we've gone into competitions now with those and uh, there's, there's models flying quite successfully with those 3D printed aileron horns um yeah i think i'd be i'd be a little bit cautious about a servo horn on the spline i'd be you know i'd want to sort of do some torque testing i guess if you can stall the servo by holding the arm then it's then it's yeah. then it's good enough no absolutely and you know i think again with all of these things it's it's a lot of trial and error you know the, the prototyping you know the, the beauty of this and what what we're going to show you is that i think I can't remember, you sent me the sketch, I think, Sunday evening, didn't you, Barry? Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. So from Sunday evening, and believe me, I've been working and Barry's been working, between us, we've been able to, to put together this model, um, the 3D model, I could refer to it as a model, 3D model. Um, I can tell you, it, I'm, I'm very hopeful it's, it's pretty accurate. We're going to send it off to Andy Ellison, I, I believe, because to, to, he's, he's actually got an RX. Yeah, he, he can plug into it and test it. Um, and hopefully Andy will come back and say it fits. If it doesn't fit, he can tell us where it needs to to alter, and we can we can we can scale the model, or we can we can alter it a little bit. Um, you know that's that's what it's that's what it's all about. Um, you know, and and again, something that's quite quick, and I think some stage we'll we'll probably show you that we've printed it, and um, you know it's sooner rather than later yeah i was going to try and tell everybody how long it was going to take it's about 24 minutes i think for uh for printing the two the pair of them there so it's not a long process um you know and and then you know they cost pennies i mean a, a reel of a reel of pla what's it about 25 pounds 20 pounds yeah something of that ilk can i mean it takes a lot to get through it doesn't it so i it, uh, I had 27 minutes print time for that for that part and nine pence material cost. Yeah, I was printing at 0.1 of a millimeter. Interesting, John John McNamara is just saying he downloaded Fusion 363 after last week's episode. And he's drawn a few things with it too. So that's that's really good to you know it's it's a good piece of kit. It's a good piece of kit. Autodesk um, are a, are a pretty amazing company in terms of what they do it, it's it's expensive their software but they do do have these certain promotions on at time that encourage people to use um some of the some of the kit there so that's that's good that's really good to see um right We've got, okay, just whilst we're on that control horn there has been a question come in about the material for those aileron torque rods and they were in a 135 mile an hour pylon racer um i used a, a filled pla a carbon filled pla from a company called proto pasta very superior material you can get it um a few places online sell it very easy to get 
Um, and it's also a material that you can post cure. Um, you can heat it up to about 110 centigrade and it gives it much better mechanical properties. It increases its heat, heat resistance and it increases its toughness and durability. So that's uh, our answering Barry Vernon's question. Okay. Cool. Let me stop sharing now because I think unless anybody wants anything more on the screen, we'll we'll stop the sharing on that. Um, right. Let me close a few things down and then get back on to. So have we got any more Q and A's on here? No. No. Well, well we've a little bit to come to later, uh, but not 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 right, not right at not right at the moment. I think probably, Mark. One of the things that I would like to say is, um, I went into doing three D printing. I was very skeptical about three D printing. I, I'd seen three D prints, and I thought they looked really awful. Um, I'm very wedded to uh, machining components, machining metals, tooling materials, mm. creating molds, that 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 kind of productions. And I, I I really didn't like what I'd seen of 3D printing. Uh, so I am a bit cynical. And I also, when I actually got over that cynicism, I'd started to see some materials and prints off of very cheap printers. I mean, I only paid two hundred pound for my printer second hand. Um, my my goal was to make parts that actually brought something to the party. I wasn't just making a part because I could three D print it. I wanted it to be uh, a some advantage in some way. So. You know, was it was it easier to 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 get something accurately mm. accurately three D printed rather than making it by hand? And I think last week you showed the uh, fuselage pattern that, that, one. that or one of those. Oh yeah, that that that's what's, oh that's the that's a cradle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's the cradle for it. Yeah, but that's yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So I, I I think you're the same, Mark. I think that you. You're not 3D printing for the sake of 3D printing. What you are doing, you're trying to make something better than, yeah. than, than what you could before. And that's a very important thing. I think both Mark and I are not particularly interested in the printer itself for the sake of the printer. No, um, no. You know, that's why we went and brought commercial, very commercial printers. Some guys get a lot of fun out of actually building the machine and making a lot of parts mm. um uh, as the printer's going that's not particularly my interest my, my my interest is to make uh parts and i actually wanted to get aero parts onto the model so mm. we we printed out something that was going to fly at sort of 130 150 mile an hour in a competition plane and i was very pleased when we got the wingtip um, working, and that wingtip, that manta ray wingtip, you you would really struggle to carve that out of balsa wood. It was so it's so thin as it swept up. For for the guys who haven't didn't see it from last week, it's something a little bit like a uh, you know an airliner upswept wing wingtip. You know, it's a wing wing fence. I think, I think you know you, you you hit a good point there i think from from my point of view from being a free flight modeler rather than a radio modeler weight is usually everything so when you say plastic plastic is very dense material it's not it's not something that's often seen to be light you you can keep very very light um you can get keep it very thin and you can support it but generally for free flight models plastic is not a good material but it is for me for jigs, for making jigs and multiple jigs, for setting up moulds and things like that, it is absolutely superb. It is it is inexpensive and it's enjoyable. You know, this is a this is a classic example. If I if I reach behind and grab something, second, to try and explain this, 
I mean, this is a this is a very simple. So this is part of a. There we go. There's the camera. Fuse large. Now that goes in there accurately, and you can see. I think you can see just about focus there. I'm trying to drill a hole in there, drill a hole through that. I can get that dead dead center drilling through this Kevlar tube. But what is more important with with multiple jigs, I can square the whole model, so I can set the model. And if you may remember the wonderful talk by Kevin Caton did on 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 setting up models on gliders and things, you know he he talked about the way it's important to set the model up before it flies in your workshop and, and building them square, making sure everything lines through. I can make a jig that costs me 20 pence or 30 pence once I've invested in the 3D and I can make it quickly. And I can set these models up so accurately now. And it was so difficult before you were cutting out pieces of plywood, sanding them. It's a day's weekend's work. I set this printing overnight, wake up the next morning, go to my workshop, take it off the bed, just check it works and we're, we're sorted. So from my point of view, jigs of all different sorts, I make, you know, we, the laser cutting when we talk about that, you know, everything I'm using there is for free flight models primarily. Um, you know, what that does, it enables me to make things for even for indoor duration models, not, you know, they're jigs for setting up, making sure things are square. You know, it, it's it's not easy with, you know, unless you've, you've got these type of, you know, this type of um, flexibility, really. It's really. One of the things when it's a big it's a big step for people to make. And I realize that not everyone's this this committed. But once you start getting the whole model into into 3D um, and then you just get it so you can get it so that everything just fits nicely because you're trying it before beforehand. I mean, the latest pylon racer that Nathan and I are, are doing um, F3D model, that's all in that's all in CAD, the whole fuse large um, wing and everything's in CAD and everything fits together so so well it's like that's oh, like a tamiya kit almost you know yeah. tamiya always had very good fits on their kit yeah. and that, that's where you, that's where you get to think, so, um, just an example this is a prototype of a timing device hopefully that will focus it should just come into focus yeah, all being well. but on the back of it is the plastic printed component we were looking at the other day with a with an aluminium cam, so we've got CNC machining, we've got laser plate cut out of glass fiber, and then we've got the three D printing all in one to create a component that is robust and accurate that I can re I can reproduce and and install with a timing device into a number of models. So again, you know, using the multiple techniques, different kit, and also I think as well m the majority of models we all help each other. So I've I've just been sent some CAD drawings and I'm I'm not opening this up to everybody because please honestly I haven't got the time. But you know, a friend of mine sort of said, Could you print these templates for me on the laser? So he sent me the the files for them. We've spoke about them. I've cut cut things before. I'll cut those off at the weekend for him, put them in the post for him, and he's sorted. You don't have to buy a laser cutter if somebody's got one. You know, no uh, learn how to prepare the files in, in CAD and they'll cut them for you. It's not a difficult process. It's a very simple process. So um, it's just something else to, to share with everybody. I think we, we've got a couple of questions that have come in about patterns, um, using 3D printed patterns and, and that kind of thing. One, one was, has anyone vacuum formed over a 3D printed um, pattern? I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be possible. I think you would tend to have to have quite a lot of infill or or close to 100% so that the vacuum didn't um, flex the um, form that, that you've got in there. So, that, yeah, I, I would definitely think that's possible. I haven't done it. Um, and our friend from Bulgaria, he's um, he's a free flight guy, Mark. I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll probably oh, John know Lebecki. him. No, he, his, um, his name is... Um, no, I can't. Uh, da, 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 da. Get in there. No, no, not John Lebicki. It's a, it's another guy. Anyway, he's he's making uh, propeller patterns and that kind of thing. Yeah, it works very well. I know 
I mean, we don't we 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 actually just machine straight to aluminium to make a a, a, a mould. But I know that some of my our, our race buddies are using three D printed yeah. forms to make a a, a, a soft mould, a board, a epoxy mould off of, and it's working well. I've seen them. I've seen them flying flying with it. Not particularly the way that I want. I wanted to go with it. Mm. There was another. There was another good point raised that um, the material, when it's printed, it's not got the same characteristics in all three planes. It because of the layers, um, mm. it's much more like a crop, like a cross grain sort of situation on, on, on the layers. Imagine it like balsa wood. Um, you know, across, uh, um, across the, the grain, it splits it, or down the length, it splits easy, and the, the other direction, it's immensely mm. strong. Uh, it's not quite so dramatic in a 3D printed part, but there definitely is um, mm. a difference in strength in, in particularly in the layered direction. It is not as strong up in that layered direction. I have to say to you um, that aluminium is exactly the same that you know don't think that metal is exactly the same in all directions it is not yeah. um you know there's a very definite grain direction and normally in aluminium it's down the uh length that it's been ex uh, rolled through the mill that's the strong that's the strong direction across mm -hmm. is the weak direction yeah i've just spotted a comment here actually from john buddy of mine over in the us um yeah he was saying about using an Ultimaker, Ultimaker 2. Now, I believe Ultimaker are very, very good machines. Um, I know a number of people that have got those. I don't know the, a Pulse XE, but again, similar to myself, um, you know, he's a free flighter as well, but he's stab mounts, cover plates, battery holders. It's all of those little things that you can make that ordinarily you'd be CNC machining or you'd be machining with a, um, a milling machine out of, out of dural or aluminium you've got the opportunity of making them out of plastic. Um, and, and they're really good, even if you're just making them again as prototyping. You may, may make something first, check it all works, and then have it made in aluminium or make it yourself in aluminium or dural. You know, again, it's another means of quick. It's pr prototyping, you know, 3D printing is wonderful for prototyping. I think one of the things, Mark, that I, I wanted to say about the machines, I've always thought of this, 3D printing a little bit like a CNC hot glue gun. You know, it's not that much different to be to be brutally honest. And I think once you've you can see that there's not a big demand on the machine for um, rigidity. You know, you're not you're not machining into a block of steel or yeah. aluminium or whatever. I I think more of it's in how you use the software. There's so many controls in that software you know down the right hand side in the cura there's a lot of stuff to do with what happens when you get to the end of the, the you know uh, of the print run you know where it's going along in a straight line it gets to the end and the nozzle has to go somewhere else you just imagine it like a hot blue gun if you just move the gun across you're getting that material oozing out of it and the, and the, the printer software it's very good at doing things like pulling the filament back and mm. and saying how much. And that's when you get into it, you you can really get good good results. I think it was um, like John said the, about the Ultimaker. I think I'd seen something come off of an Ultimaker too, which was what kind of made made me think, oh, this is looking uh, more more sensible. But now I realise. It's actually probably they were just using the software well, you know. I mean, the stuff yeah. that we've done off of these Dremels and Flash Forge printers, they're all it's the patterns are almost to the standard of a machined. No, I pattern. agree. I mean, Ron Gray mentions here heat can be a problem with 3D pr you know printer molds. Yeah, I mean, yes, you can. I mean, you're not going to be baking, yeah. baking glass fiber in the oven with a with a plastic mold, agreed. Um, but what you can do is you could you could quite easily take a plaster cast of it or you could take a cast of it in resin once you've made it because you can do that. 
um, and that saves you machining it from CNC, you know, and you can actually sand the resin. You can smooth that down and and create a wonderful mold from it, you know, right. or you can cast. You know, there are, again, it's just being a little bit sort of lateral thinking with the product once you get it. And it's, I think the starting point is to play with the software. Once you play with the software, and that's producing the model, making the model itself, you'll just you'll just find uses for it wherever. You know, I've I've had it where people have said, oh, my, something's gone wrong with the plumbing. You know, there's a, a little valve or something and somebody's just made it and 3D printed it and, and changed it rather than throwing a whole tap assembly away. You know, it's... It, it's it is wonderful it's 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 a fantastic tool um you know um i've got a couple of questions on laser we probably ought to cover a couple of those bits off before we we, we yeah. head out because obviously some people turned up specifically for laser cutting but we will try and probably cover that next week are we are we barry we yeah yeah that's right we'll have we'll we'll have a laser cutter over yours or mine yeah. um, um running ron, ron gray asked a question does vase printing or vase printing add to strength i don't know quite what that means so i, I think that i i tried it once i think it's where it ah it spirals <laughs> spirals round i i didn't have a lot of lot of success with it so i, I i've kept to, kept away from it. that's not to say that it doesn't work um i just didn't 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 use it yeah, I hadn't picked up on the term there, but I, I know what you're saying. There are different ways of, of infill as well. There's lots of different ways of printing you can set. And also the thickness of the, the wall thicknesses. I mean, there's I mean, there was I think there was probably 80 or, or 90 different options on that menu we were looking at earlier. Um, you know, and I, I have to say that was one of the big things on getting the fuel tanks working was fiddling around with yeah. the with the settings. And maybe we'll put up on the um facebook uh bmf8 facebook i might put up some of the settings and what have you that we used on on the fuel fuel tank we'll get andy to do that in a week or so's time um trevor water said taking the example of a spinner how do you get a smooth finish to smooth out the layer lines well in truth a lot of it you can be rid of by the settings so again looking at the temperature of the print looking at the material i mean I, one thing I haven't experimented with because it's it's probably the most expensive thing to do is having 10 or 15 different materials that you you try different ones and see how they print differently. But I think from my point of view, those those lines are there. Sometimes the and I don't know, there's an, an anomaly here and I, I'm sure it's to do with the print settings you get into. But sometimes if you go for a medium print, it will print better than some of the ultimate quality ones. And it just depends. And I there must be something in there. But again, as Barry's saying, there are so many different options for printing. Um, you just really need to experiment. So, you know, get get your make yourself a spinner mold up or, or, or you know, the, the website we pointed out earlier. Get one of those on there and just keep experimenting. All of a sudden you'll find one just works brilliantly well. I've printed down to 0.3 millimeter wall thickness. Um, and that's quite tricky because you end up with lots of bits of, uh, of nothing. <laughs> but eventually. You get your settings right. If you get the temperature setting right, you can you can make it work. And that wall thickness is impre impressive. Then it's very very good. I think the question about the, the getting rid of the layer the layer lines. I mean, if you're just going to have the part as a natural printed part, you you're going to really struggle to yeah. get rid of the the layer lines. If you're going to paint it or something like that, you know you can. Sand, sand it down give it a coat of primer sand it down again and get quite a good mm. quite a good um finish for the patterns like was like we showed last week for the little pylon racer the little c32 model um that would have had i mean nathan done that so he will have he will have done quite a bit of hand finishing on 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 that pattern mm. but it you know, even a even a um, a, a machined pattern needs quite a, a reasonable amount of finishing. The three D printed one definitely needs more hand finishing, but not to the degree where you're losing the accuracy of the model. You know, we're we're not talking of drifting quarter of a millimetre or anything like that. We're probably talking 
you know, 0.1 of a millimetre, something like that. I would think that the primer build-up was probably order 100, 120 microns on, on something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're still maintaining your accuracy. Um, Barry Vernon mentions, um, or questions, does the nozzle size on a 3D printer have any impact on quality? Does it restrict the size of each layer you can use? i done a tiny bit of printing with 0.2 millimetre. Normally, most nozzles are 0.4 of a millimetre. One of the problems when you're going down in the nozzle size, the amount of material that you can get through it is dramatically reduced. When you look at the surface area of the nozzle, mm -hmm. 0.2 of a millimetre and 0.4, it's, you're not talking of half the surface area, and it's pi r squared and what have you. Um, you know, it's a lot less area. So prints take a lot longer. I also think that one of the things you, you touched on it earlier, Mark, of um, if you were printing 10 components in a layer, mm. I think there's some need to be getting the next layer on quite quickly after yeah. the last one. The material's still warm. Whereas if you are going, a, you know, along 10 pieces, it's gone cold by the time um, you've got back to putting your next layer on. So yeah. that's, found, that's something to consider. I've specifically found that when I've been doing 100% prints or 80% fill, yeah. when you're laying down an awful lot of material, then then there is a, I found that to be a real problem and you really need to concentrate on it. Um, and I've, I've always found it more difficult to do those solid fills as well as the the infill ones and again it will be down to settings and it's down to just experimenting you know um you know be i think that somewhere. i think that the um question the, the guy i think it might have been dave woods who who said about the um difference in strength in the layer direction i think the longer it is before you can get back to getting the next bit of material on i think that will, will have a negative effect on that strength in 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 the z direction and uh, the, the layer direction yeah interestingly ron ron gray comes back with abs plus acetone smoothing gives us very smooth prints yes never tried that no well i've not printed any abs i don't um my my printer can't do that i've not got a heated bed or anything on yeah. on i don't think yours has either yeah i've, I've got it i've got abs oh, you've got it. Yeah, I've I've not I've not done that. No, we, mostly PLA is what I've, what I've printed. And there's one of the things with three D printing is there's so much momentum out in the world for three D printing. There's, that means there's a lot of people who are working on materials and 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 that kind of thing. So there's mass, massive momentum in the in the whole. Uh, sphere of 3D printing and you know I've done we used a they call it TPU it's like rubber materials we've done uh, wheel wheels and, and that kind of thing tires sorry tires um, with the TPU material um, good question here from we'll, we'll, we'll have to wrap up in a few minutes but John Minchell asks um, it takes many many iterations of prototyping to get the correct finished item is there a way of recycling the scrap items into filament again? Um, yeah, there is. I've seen I've seen that something about that on YouTube. Uh, um, recycling, recycling the, the, the filament. Um, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you hit the part bang on the first time. Shall we show the 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 receiver holders now, Mark? Because you've got one. You've got the receiver holder that we model yeah yeah sorry i i, I was looking at so, the... we, so yeah john you something like the fuel tank i've done 50 um this little thing that we had on the screen earlier both mark and i printed one this afternoon first time it's there it's usable so some parts particularly if they're like something that you've been doing previously you can you can go to it and you, it, it works works first first time. Yeah. So when you do something very different, let's say something like that wing tip, 
or the fuel tank. Yeah, there was a, then then there's a lot of iterations. Um, there's there's one one real critical thing on this. So I've I've played around with very again free flight problem. It always making things lighter. So getting my wall thicknesses as thin as possible. Well, Barry said to me, I'll make them one mil thick, and I went, Wow, that's easy. You know, a wall, one mil print is just so easy. Once you start yeah. to get sub one millimeter, it gets harder and harder because there is a lot less material and it's trying to layer it. Um, and it, it has to be very accurate. If anything, it's very slightly out or the or the plow temperature drops or anything like that. It, it does it misses a bit and then the next layer can't go. It's got nothing to adhere to. It's very, very difficult to print a quarter of a millimetre wall thickness from a 0.4 millimetre nozzle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I will try it in a nozzle. I must try that some stage. Yeah. I, I haven't actually done that. But but in truth, you know, half a millimetre is normally fine. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not a not a huge problem. Right. Um, well, should we take a couple of these laser questions, see if we can answer yeah. these? Um, and they will find out whether we're going to present next week. Otherwise, we probably don't know anything about lasers. But anyway. <laughs> um, well, okay. So what have we got there? Are there yeah. any reasonably priced laser printers? I think the guy Anthony meant laser cutters for home use. So, yeah. Mark, right? Let's let's say where we are on laser laser cutters and and where they well, let, let, let me start it off and then you can you can you can reel me back in because yeah you know what i'm going to say here there are and i've got friends who have got the and i'm going to be very generic here the cheap chinese printers okay. let's call them k40s that's what they often call them k40s k40s um imported they are primitive they work um Barry's fear and my fear with them is a little bit that the engineering on them, the electrics on them, don't probably conform quite as well as they need to in terms of the safety aspect of the laser. Um, I don't know of any... Somebody's probably got some horror stories. They're probably absolutely fine. But again, I don't know whether they have CE approval recognition or EU approvals, this, that and the other, although we're out of EU now. But anyway, Barry... You fill in the questions. Okay. So some of those, you, you can get laser cutters for £300 and you can cut model aircraft kits out on them, you know, cut wing ribs and bulkheads and all that kind of thing up to sort of, certainly up to quarter inch plywood on such things. Call them, call them K40s. They're 40 watt CO2 laser cutters. Some of them are CE marked. You have to remember that the China, some people in China think that CE stands for China export, not <laughs> conformity Europe. Um, I think both, I, I did have a cheap Chinese laser cutter. It caught fire. But to be fair to the laser cutter, it was not the laser cutter's fault. It was my son-in-law was using it and he turned his back on, on it and it was actually the part that caught fire. And it, it completely burnt the thing out. You know, it was a, it was a worry. Um, but that was operator error. So we can't blame the cutter for that. You would never get one of those Chinese cutters into a school or an industrial environment. They very rarely have got the right um, uh, interlocks and that kind of thing. But I think the laser cutter you've got, Mark, is a Chinese cutter that's been uh heavily worked on by yes. hpc up in yorkshire yeah. um uh, so that it meets all of the ce standards you could safely put it into a school so yeah you can be laser laser cutting from probably 300 350 pounds and i bet you could probably find them on ebay um but but for, for less than that having said that i wouldn't um i wouldn't turn my back on one of those things for not even 10 seconds no. um diode one, oh, one of the sorry, big Mark. questions no 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 one of the big questions which i will cover off a few here um usually they're co2 cutters is the answer um i've not i've not played with a diode laser don't know enough about it um but from from my point of view the the power of the laser for the majority of what we want for modeling 
if it's balsa wood, if it's plywood and it's not too thick, you can get away with some very, very low powered laser cutters. You don't need big power. However, it's good to have that flexibility. And I think you just I would look at the range, look at what you can afford. Um, mine's an 80 watt laser. Um, and I can cut eight millimeter plywood quite happily, 10 millimeter plywood quite happily. Um, but I can also cut. 16 thou or 15 thou balsa wood setting it at around about six percent power so it, it's flexible it's flexible i think they're, they're pretty simple machines um the safety aspect is is really what i i would put across to anybody is just consider that um yeah. you know it, the one thing with a laser and i said it last week 3d printer I, i'll leave it running if it if it has a problem, it has a problem, but I, I won't leave the, leave the laser cutting without me being at least in, in it, you know, earshot of it. I want to know that something's right. Yeah. Um, and I've got it, smoke detectors and heat detectors next to it just in case as well. To be fair, it might not, the fire that we had was not the laser cutter's fault. It was that my son-in-law turned his back on it, um, left the left the job running and, it, and the actual plywood caught fire. Yeah. Um, so that's, but yeah, I think the other thing is, is the 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 printers, uh, those kind of printers that we got, the Dremels are uh, and the, the Flash Forges, those kind, they are UL rated, which is an American rating. And I'm pretty sure that that rating that they've been rated to is, uh, although they say don't turn your back on it, I'm pretty sure that that rating is one that says the machine's good good to go if you if you turn your back on it yeah. a, la a, la a laser cutter you'd be you'd be reckless yeah reckless. i mean ron gray points out a 20 watt diode will cut 12 millimeter plywood so there you, you know there you go it's a slightly different technology clearly um because i don't think a 20 mil a 20 watt co2 would cut that thickness and i think it it might do it at a very very slow speed i, I don't know but um again there this is this is technology moving on i guess it's a different form of cutting so yeah um, i think john's question is probably the best one uh, a good one to answer before we before we wrap um in john minchin as the materials machines have a capital cost what what do you recommend of the three choices 3d printer free access mill laser cutter i think john it depends what you're doing but i i'm afraid i have to go with mark on that and say probably the 3d printer um you know i i i i have all three of those machines i think mark does as well um yeah i i, I think a 3d printer because you can get into it at a low lowish cost um you you know there's a whole world of difference when you actually start cutting material off of something rather than adding it on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 3D, 3D printer. And I've just, just read from uh, my buddy, Mike Francis, he comes back and he agrees as well. So uh, Mike has been at this a lot longer than yeah. I have. And, and probably yourself, Barry, Mike was at the cutting edge of this very, very long time ago. Certainly CNC he built his own CNC machine a long time ago. I know. Yeah. Now. Um, I think, the the one the one thing that seeing that three D printing has over everything else, it's it's relatively inexpensive, it's clean, it's it produces a finished product very 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 quickly, and actually the materials are very cheap to to use through it as well. Uh, yes, you can get some very very expensive materials, you can get very expensive three D printers, and you, but I think for what we're talking about, this this layered type printer. I think it ticks the majority of boxes. A laser printer, I'll be honest with you, I don't use it that much. I don't have the need for it the same way as I do the 3D printer for what I want for modelling. Um, you know, I'm not building kits, making lots and lots of kits or something like that, you know, and not mass producing anything. Late and, but there, it's, it's personal preference, but 3D printer, I think, wins. Yeah, 3D printer. Um, if you're just... Just hobby, hobby stuff, um, 3D printer, and uh, no, no doubt about it. You can't, I, I can't see how you can easily make money off of a 3D printer. You know, I mean, 
as you know, Mark, I've been machining carbon parts all through the last sort of three or four days. Just couldn't make that kind of money off of a off of a printer. No. Um, you know, it's just not not there. Um, no. Horses for courses, and that's what the, the whole nub of what Mark and I are talking about is. There's not one answer for everything. If you have to take an answer, if you have to just say, oh, I've got, let's say, let's say you had a budget of £400, you'd have to go with it, uh, get a nice little 3D printer, learn to use it, and you'd be turning out some fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. That would only just get you in at the bottom end of plug and play laser cutters i mean people will come back and say oh, i can get a laser cutter going for for this much money but if you're just talking about putting a box on a table stuff into work um yeah it's a 3d printer and i didn't think i would if, if you'd asked me that question five years ago i'd have said no nah, so no no way right, well, but, I, I think we should probably wrap it up there being so that we're going to be back next week and everybody yeah. as we're, we're <laughs> pretty fed up with us by then um but i, I think you know um interesting i'm just looking at some of the comments here um make money from the 3d designs you know yes i i think i think from I, I just think one of the things that we can do and i think you know with andy's assistance and the bmfa here as well that why don't we start a repository or you know to actually start to put a lot of these components in there so that people can download them and use them. You know, I think that's something we probably ought to set up. Um, Easy enough to do. And we can encourage people to, you know, put some examples on. I'd love to print other people's examples and see what it's like and and go for that. Um, I think we, we should say, Mark, that next week we are going to make some smoke. We are going to cut with the laser cutters. We are. We are. We're are you definitely going to? You're going to be yeah, in the one cutting, are you? Yeah, I, I'm. Re I'm. Re I'm really happy to 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 do that. Yeah, I. I'm. I'm quite. I have to rig up something out in the workshop so that we can see that. But I think for a lot of folks, that will be a, a a good thing to see. Yeah. Um, I'll dig some videos out that I've got because I'm, yeah. I'm not going to put. I'm not going to um, broadcast from the from my garage. It's a bit dark and cold and dingy in there, but um, yeah. And it's a bit noisy as well because the extractor going, because that's the other thing with a laser. I always have an extractor going quite heavy. So yeah. get the fumes out. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, thank you for the comments. Um, a little bit of a, us nattering talking through, but I think it's, it's good to stimulate some thoughts. And um, again, if you've got any overlap we're quite happy to overlap next week with some some more questions on 3d printing and cnc but we'll we'll try and focus on laser next week yeah andy anything from you you sat there no, quietly. No. i was quietly listening and multitasking here as normal <laughs> Excellent. that's that's really good no well, I, we didn't, I didn't know you were a woman andy uh, well, well, as you know, Barry, all those men can multitask, but we don't want everybody to know because they'll ask us to. That's right. <laughs> okay, see you all next week. Yeah, yeah, see you all next week. Everybody, look forward to seeing you all next week.